Good morning. Good morning, everyone. You guys are tough through the rain. Man, that is something out there. Praise the Lord, though. We need the rain. It's good for us. But we like to whine a little bit. But we won't do that this morning. We, we love the rain. And it's nice to have new windows. So we're, got, we're going around making sure they don't leak. Not in here, but in other parts of the building, making sure there's no water coming in. So this is a good test for us, right? I think it's holding up so far. But good morning. We're glad you're, you're here with us. If, if you're a, a visitor, first-time visitor, we would like to send you a just a letter helping you better understand the church. Behind the back of the pews or in the chairs, you can find a visitor's card. And if you don't, there's visitor cards near the, um, the sound booth as well. And you can fill that out, drop it in the, uh, in the box right on the wall as you exit, and we would be glad to, again, give you more information about the church. But, and we have a luncheon today, so if you'd like to come downstairs right after church, there's going to be a lot of food, and you're welcome to do that. A couple of announcements, not a lot of them, but Vacation Bible School, I'm going to keep plugging that, June 11th to the 15th. We still need some, some helpers, and uh, if you can help in any way, there are forms to fill out in the foyer, a basket to put it in, and Tasha Herm, somebody will be getting back to you. Um, and eventually they'll tell me to quit asking because we have enough helpers, but until that happens, I'm gonna keep asking because um, that's a great event. We need plenty of hands. Also, you probably didn't see it today, but the playground equipment was repainted yesterday. We had like 15 or 16 people out here painting away. Kate's always, Kate, you're in all the pictures when they're painting. She's stained. I'm supposed to tell you this, there are benches on that little gazebo, you call that a gazebo, whatever that wooden structure, that will be stained because it's a different color than the rest of it. Um, but that we have to wait a few weeks for it to dry. Today won't be helpful, but <laughs> once it's dry, that'll be stained. And man, so, so nice out there. We're grateful for all the folks that came out and did that. Also, a new book, Going Higher with God in Prayer, A.W. Tozer, can never do wrong there. And I'm going to read this to you. It will be back in the library like all the other new books that we continue to bring in. Uh, learning how to pray is one of the greatest challenges in a Christian's life. A.W. Tozer pointed out that the church's greatest curse is unanswered prayer and that many people do not seem bothered by that. Maybe they don't understand what answered prayer is all about. Tozer outlines this as, as only he can describing the kind of prayer God answers and the kind of prayer that leaves him silent. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself, are my prayers today more powerful and effective than they were a year ago? Our God, uh, our good Father wants them to be. So you wanna learn more about prayer from a man who can be very helpful? You can check that out and, and look at the other books. We have uh, lots of books in there. With that, I want to, uh, and this went out this week in the PPA, it's probably in your bulletin. There, are, uh, there is a new elder being proposed, Keith Carter, who has been a deacon since the founding of this church and a good friend and just a godly man. And so we are putting his name forward, the elders are. On June 4th, we'll do a, a congregational vote, which is what we do. If you have conversations you wanna have with him, you have three weeks. After that, he's hopefully gonna be voted in. I think he will. So that's gonna be, that's exciting as we grow, we need uh, additional elders. The last thing is there will be uh, a brief meeting after service. So we're not gonna do the last song. We're gonna try to tighten up a little bit. And here I'm talking too long. Uh, we're going to um, do a meeting, but before the members, it's members only. You need to be a member of the church because it is a membership meeting. I'm going to release some folks, everybody to go, get your kids. If you're a member, come back in. Ten minutes is all we're going to have, right? It won't take a long time. Those of you that may not be members at this point, the, the, the uh, luncheon is going to be going on downstairs, so you can make your way down there, and we'll join you shortly thereafter. But I need you to pick up your kids and get back as quickly as you can so we can continue into the luncheon. So that'll happen right after church, and the luncheon is down there. And the only other thing to say is parking in the neighborhood. You are legally able to park anywhere that is legal within these streets, but don't pull in front of any driveways. Give a foot or two near the driveways 
We haven't had a bunch of complaints, almost none, but we just want to be considerate of the neighbors, and, uh, and so that would be good. Let's pray. Father, help us to worship you well this morning. Help us, um, as we do the Lord's Supper, to meditate well, to think of our own sin, and to repent if there is sin that needs repenting of, and to just make sure that we stay right with you, just not grieving your spirit. And Lord, the preaching of the word, I pray that you would make that beneficial and fruitful and that we would all grow. And then any here that don't know you in a personal way, Christ, I pray that you would save them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand as we prepare ourselves to sing to our God. We'll be reading from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together.
Good morning. It is wet outside, but I hope we're calmed now and we are beginning to prepare our hearts for communion, this great ordinance that Christ initiated. And I, before we partake, I would like to make a few comments about the importance and the meaning of this ordinance. Men, if you will come forward and you can begin to serve the people. Now this ordinance is spiritual in nature. And it's only meant for the family, the family of God. This is a family feast. So if you have not trusted Christ as your savior today, we ask that you not partake because the natural man can have no communion with Christ. 
only those that are his. John Calvin said, he calls the crucifixion of Christ the hinge which, on which salvation turns. Martin Luther said, he calls it a gospel spring opened to refresh sinners. And I would agree. So the importance of this ordinance, this ordinance comes from the highest possible authority. I like Luke's account. Jesus was going through so many things. And Jesus, uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, it says, on the night that he was betrayed, lots going on. He's getting ready to be betrayed. And he is giving his disciples that last bit of instruction. And in Luke's account, uh, the disciples were wondering who's going to be the greatest still. But Jesus was very focused on his instruction to them. He even set up the very place for the Passover meal. So this comes at the very highest authority, this ordinance which, we, which we're about to partake of. Jesus Christ himself established it. And it will be in force until the Lord returns. Scripture says that in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. And it's personal. We may, we may be able to fool other people about our sin, but it does not escape God's notice. This ordinance brings us face to face with our sin. It humbles us. It draws us into self-examination, which we will do in a minute. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29 of our text pulls us into self-examination. Thomas Watson said, let us dress ourselves by a scripture mirror before we come to the Lord's table. It isn't an ordinance to trifle with, for sure. It is very serious in nature. This reflection time helps us to see our sin and to mortify it. It tests the attitudes of our hearts. There's no room for pride here. It's, it's a humbling thing. That penalty paid for us. And it's established because we are prone to forget. That's why we do it as often as we do, because we're prone to forget. We get busy in life, and we sometimes just, the crucifixion, the blood of Christ, sometimes pales. It happens. And around this table, our faith is increased, and the unity that we have one to another is strengthened. Now, the meaning. Christ's shed blood for sinners provides us with so many benefits. Thomas Watson again says, it is one thing for a traitor to be pardoned, and another thing to be brought into favor. Sin cuts us off from God's Christ. Blood cements us to God. And we see God's great love for us. Even in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That says it all. So I was thinking about this and I wrote this down. I said, suppose you were brought before a great king. You were guilty of crimes. You were the lowly of lowliest. And your crimes were punishable by death. The king was to pronounce your sentence. To your amazement, the king says, in my mercy, I have given my own son to take the punishment for you. He has died in your place. You are pardoned. He could have said, you're pardoned, now you can go. But no. Because of my son's sacrifice, the great king, he says, I have adopted you as a son and an heir in my household. You will receive inheritance in my household. That's what we have in Christ. So what should be our response? I always go through my grandmother's old hymnal, and I'm looking for 
just the right words of a hymn. This should be our response. Blessed assurance, Fanny Crosby, 1873. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. So with that, let's take a few moments to examine our hearts, and then we will partake the elements together. Let's partake. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your church. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these precious people. Lord, I pray that your cross, Jesus, will always be in our remembrance. Help us to grasp the full weight of what has gone on there and what was accomplished there in our behalf. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you that we are heirs of yours. We have a great inheritance and we have great hope. Lord, I pray for the preaching of your word this day. Pray that you'll be with Brother Kevin as he brings your word and may your spirit speak through him mightily this day that it will have great effect on your people that we might change and grow in holiness before you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
is always new song of the month, not in me. Very great song. Let's sing those truths and take it close to heart. turning in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13 again. I just want to say, if the hope was to condense the service, they picked the wrong guy. <laughs> that is not one of my spiritual gifts. Um, so I'm going to be speaking fluctuating between one and a quarter and one and a half speed, so you're going to have to listen fast. <clears throat> let, me, um, let me read our text. It'll be 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, and then I'll pray. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Father, we want 
to love one another as you have loved us in Christ Jesus. And we confess that even with the Spirit dwelling within us, this is hard. It is hard to have the kind of love in us, working out through us, that represents the love that you showed to us and have given to us in Christ. And so we confess and ask forgiveness where we have failed. We pray for your help to do this in the opportunities that we have, in the relationships that we have in this church body and with others. And Lord, I pray that you would fill up what is lacking in this message so that all of your people will be encouraged, strengthened, edified, in love with you more, and more conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So if the essential mark of the Christian is Christian love, then it would serve us well to know what this love looks like. And what I hope to do this morning is to look at the individual qualities that we have here in verses four through eight that Paul lines out as they are defined and described by him and then show them in how God has demonstrated the quality and perfection of his love towards us in Jesus Christ. It does absolutely no good for Paul to give us instructions and definitions and characteristics of a divine love if that divine person has not showed that love to us himself. That would be a do as I say, not as I do. And so we're gonna look at this under three main headings. The first is Christian love reviewed, then qualities defined, and then qualities displayed. And it's not gonna be It's going to be more of a rolling type um, division. I'm not going to say, here we are, we've now arrived at division two or outline point number two. It's going to be flowing. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at how this love is the defining mark of the Christian and how where it is absent, there is no reliable evidence whatsoever that Christ is present at all. If this love doesn't indwell you, then you have no assurance that Christ does. There's an early Christian music group whose lead singer would include in all of their concerts a charge to those who were attending. He lived and worked, this lead singer lived and worked in the inner city of Chicago. And I don't typically look to contemporary Christian music for my theology, but what he said is something that I've never forgotten. And it's been almost 40 years ago. I was 11 years old, and this stuck with me. The way you treat the person you love the least is the way that you love God the most. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) That's a stinging statement. It's the kind of statement that sticks for 40 years and counting. It's the kind of statements that our minds rush to rationalize away. Kind of like the lawyer who sought to test Jesus about who inherits eternal life according to the law. The lawyer answered by quoting the law, which says we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus says, you're correct, you're right. And then the lawyer, hoping to distance himself from what goes way beyond what he thinks he's obligated to do or what he hopes he's not obligated to do, he attempts to rationalize it away by asking what he thinks is an unanswerable question. And who is my neighbor? In Jewish thought and teaching, one's neighbor was an ambiguous thing. It only included fellow Jews, but even with that, it had qualifications to it as to who a neighbor actually was. So Jesus gives a parable of the Good Samaritan, which is kind of hilarious because in the Jews' minds, there's no such thing as a good Samaritan. It'd be like saying, oh yeah, so-and-so, he's a good, wicked person. And so rather than leave any wiggle room whatsoever for rationalizing away the kind of Christian love 
that we should have towards one another, Paul's going to describe it in all of its perfection. As we get into these qualities, it's going to become quite clear, quite quickly, that we fall quite far short of these perfections. What Paul describes in verses four through eight is a love divine. Commentators have called it love in action. It's helpful, helpful to think of it as love personified because like we looked at a couple of weeks ago in verses one through three, it's through God's people and through the love of Jesus in them, working out of them that others will see the quality of God's love. So Paul will leave us without question as to what this love looks like. But in doing this, he'll also leave us without any doubt or without any question or without any confusion as to where love is not. In the first three verses, Paul describes a person of impeccable gifts, knowledge, and character. I would go so far as to see, even say divine or at least divinely gifted gifts. But it's also a person of absolutely no worth whatsoever without love. And not just any love, but a love of divine quality. One pastor has written, the pages of Christian history show that men will fight and die for Christianity who will not live in its spirit, which is love. And that spirit is the spirit of Christ. His love abiding in us and working out through us as a church towards one another and towards the culture and world around us. Remember what Jesus prayed for in John 17? It's a long prayer. But in that section, he prays this. That they all may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them as you loved me. Now there is hardly a more clear statement telling us of the love that dwells within each and every Christian. It's divine. It's perfect in its nature. It's unifying. And it's indestructible. How about yours? How about the love that dwells within you? How does the love you show measure up to this? Is the love you have for one another unifying? Is it indestructible? The love of Christ towards you and in you is. It's both of these things. But is that quality coming out in your love for one another as the body of Christ. Paul's struggle in the Corinthian church was one of a lack of this kind of love. It was absent. And it's not changed much down through the centuries. We still struggle with this. So let's look at verses four through eight and the qualities of this love to see what it is that we need to strive to live in. Love is patient and kind. And so you're probably thinking, there are times when this describes me. I'm doing good. <laughs> and that's, that is a great start. Those, these qualities, though, are those that need to characteristically define us. They're not the exception. They are the rule. They are what is constant. And the exception would be impatience and unkindness. Those are the blips on the radar that don't make any sense. Those are the peaks in the curve that can't be explained. Paul's describing a quality that is characteristically mild and long-suffering, able to endure with forbearance any injury, any criticism, any offense, and any unkindness from others. We're given a good example of this in 1 Thessalonians 5.14 where Paul writes, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. And then he says something to qualify that. Be patient with them all. Now, these are three types of people that can be hard on the unity of a church. The unruly are those who Paul sees as 
putting their own opinions or their own preferences, their own pet beliefs, or themselves as that which is the most important thing. They're very effective at wrecking the peace of the body. Paul says to be patient with them, be kind towards them. They're the faint-hearted, those who need encouragement, those who need to be reminded of who they are in Christ over and again. They struggle with circumstances, with depression, with anxiety, with assurance, with sin, and all manner of other things that we need to be quick to come to their aid in over and over and over again and again and again in patience and in kindness. And then there are those who lapse under temptation into sin or false thinking or doctrinal error. We are to be kind and patient, ready to restore, ready to correct, faithful to them in all things. It has the sense of being benign. The best word that you can hear about a potentially dead, deadly cancer that's been found in your body is that it's harmless. It's benign. And each one of us has the potential to be a very destructive force in the life of a church. James writes that the greatest of forests can be destroyed by a small fire. And then he says that our tongues are a fire. At any given moment, a lack of love from an impatient and unkind tongue can cause immense and massive destruction. So doesn't benign need to be the word that describes us? Harmless? One commentator writes that Chrysostom said, this is the word used of the man who is wronged and who easily has the power to avenge himself but will not do it out of mercy and out of patience. Does this not describe Jesus? He is by no means harmless. He has at his disposal 12 legions of angels. But he comes to those who are seeking forgiveness from the king, the king of kings, the one who they've offended. He comes to them as a benign savior a friend, a redeemer, not counting our sins against us because in his great love, he took them upon himself and died to pay the price for them. This is patience. This is kindness. So how are you measuring up so far? Stacking the love you have for one another against this love so far. And it's just two qualities. (laughs) How are you measuring up? We've got a ways to go yet. Paul moves from what this love is, patient and kind, to what it is not. It is not jealous. I think we're best served by thinking about the jealousy God has for his own glory rather than the jealousy found in the relationship of two people. Although this passage is most often used in the context of marriage, Paul is addressing the corporate life of the church. He's not addressing marriage here. He's he's addressing the relationships that we have with one another in this body that we live in. This jealousy is one that seeks its own glory in these relationships and doesn't like it when someone else has the place that it believes it deserves. Charles Hodge says that it's meant to convey the tendency to have wrong feelings, particularly jealousy and envy, aroused in view of the good of others. When someone else advances, when someone else has prominence, when someone else gets what you think you deserve, there's jealousy that crops up. And not joy. If you have a study Bible, a note on this might say that this jealousy has the desire to advance at the disadvantage of others. Excuse me while I climb over you to get where I think I need to be. When someone falls or missteps, you're happy that you've just advanced up one rung higher. 
This jealousy resents the blessing and the giftedness, the success or notoriety of others. The very opposite of this is seen in Philippians where Paul is in jail. He writes about those preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry and selfish ambition, hoping that their own prominence will now advance because Paul is imprisoned. And how does he reply to this? He says this, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, whatever their motives are, whether they're selfish or selfless, I don't care. What I care about and what I glory in is that Christ Jesus is proclaimed. In that, I rejoice. In other words, I'm not jealous of anyone who is effectually preaching and proclaiming Christ, who is actually living these things out. Why would I be jealous of that? More power to them. Put me in a thousand prisons if that's what's going to advance the gospel. That's Paul's attitude. No hint at all of jealousy. And in a similar way of not being jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant. One translation reads that love doesn't cherish inflated ideas of its own importance or its own worth. It neither admires itself nor tells others all the reasons it deserves to be admired. For those of you who have kids, there is a book out, and I can't remember the author author of it. It's called Fool Moon Rising. Instead of F-U-L-L, it's F-O-O-L. It's a children's book. It is very good. I I still read it. It's about my speed these days. So it neither admires itself nor tells others all the reasons that it deserves to be admired. Proverbs 27, 2 says to let another praise you. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Elsewhere, Scripture talks about a person's gifting, making a clear path for that person. The person doesn't need to beat his own drum when it's Christ who gives gifts to his church and makes it abundantly clear to everyone when he does so. Bragging and arrogance gets in the way of that and often ruins beyond repair that which would have been considered worthy and welcomed and esteemed. That's what arrogance and bragging does. Love does not make a parade out of itself. It doesn't crave attention and it's very well content and joyful in the progress of others. It's content on the sidelines because that is where God has placed that person and recognizes that. Love does not act unbecomingly. Simply put, it doesn't act rude or crude. It's not offensive. It's respectful and decent in language and in action. If you have to say, pardon my language, either before you say something or after you've said it, then having a genuine love for the other person probably would have prevented you from saying what you did altogether. You always know that something unkind and unloving is coming when you hear someone say, I'm sorry, but I have to be honest. Rarely does anything good, edifying, loving, patient, or kind come after a prefatory statement like that. I love so-and-so, but... I hear that a lot at work. I love that guy, but may as well finish that statement by admitting that you don't love that person. Because what you're about to say is going to prove that you don't. Paul tells us not to let any unwholesome word proceed out of our mouths, but only that which builds the other person up. He doesn't qualify this by saying, unless it's the truth about that person. If the truth hurts, then genuine Christian love covers it. It doesn't exploit it. It doesn't parade it. It doesn't talk about it. It covers it so as to be unnoticed or attention not drawn to it. 
It doesn't expose it. And it doesn't use it as a means to shame that person. Love has manners. It's gallant and chivalrous. Like the example of the man who places his coat over the muddy puddle so that the lady he's walking with can walk over it without getting muddy. Genuine love isn't the man who places his coat over the puddle. Genuine love is the coat. And we need to see that. We need to understand that. Are you willing to be walked on so that someone else doesn't get muddy? Is that the quality of your love? It certainly was the quality of Jesus's. Love does not seek its own. This is similar to not being arrogant, but also has the meaning of being willing to surrender one's own desires for the well-being of others. Love seeks the way of the other person. It puts the other person's interests, happiness, joy, goodness, above what may be something that we want for ourselves. Is it time? Man, I just don't have time to do this. It rolls out the red carpet to put others first. It's not selfish for its own happiness or its own recognition. It promotes the happiness, the well-being, the prominence of another. Love is not irritable or resentful. The Greek sense of this is to sharpen. But rather than being sharpened for beneficial use, it's a sharpening that leads to hurting someone because of our impatient irritability. Our sharpest and most cutting words come out when we're provoked, don't they? When we're impatient. That's when we can be the meanest. And that's when our words can have their sharpest edge. And that's when they cut the deepest. Paul is saying that true Christian love is not easily provoked. It doesn't lash out with a sharp edge, with an intent to cut or to wound. Rather, it keeps the nice, dull, round tip and edge of a butter knife that could never be used for harm. This love enables us to not be quickly and easily offended. It's not touchy. And it doesn't have a hair trigger that fires at the slightest pressure. It can absorb injury, insult, and offense. Neither does it harbor resentment or keep record of wrongs. It doesn't become embittered. One commentator states, here is a verbal portrait of a bookkeeper who flips the pages of his ledger to reveal what has been and been received and spent. He is able to give an exact account and provide an itemized list of wrongs at any point. Well, back here last week, do you remember what you said to me? Do you remember what you did to me? You did it also back in three weeks. Anyway, what if Christ kept a record of wrong? Even as Christians, what if Christ kept a record of our wrongs? Did you read your Bible this week? How many, time, how many hours did you spend watching TV and how many minutes did you spend praying? How was your attitude towards that person who offended you? What if Christ kept a record of wrongs? What if he was irritable and resentful? What if he flew off the handle? What if his anger and unforgiveness had a hair trigger? What if he had biting and cutting words for those who treated him the way we treat others? Aren't you glad he's not any of these things? Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness or evil, but rejoices with the truth. 
Now, a lot of commentators will comment on the evil in a culture and how we should rejoice when truth prevails. It's almost like Paul has zoomed in on the relational side of the church or relational aspects of the church, and now he's zoomed out to the culture at large. And while there's certainly application to be made, I think that Paul is still dealing with the personal relationships within the body here. Truth is and always has been maligned and hated in the culture. As it is in our day, so it was in this one. Unrighteousness has always been accepted and even celebrated. We're not seeing anything new today that wasn't present at some time in the past. Maybe at all times in the past. Paul is still admonishing the church to take great pain in not becoming like the culture and not treating one another in a way that those who don't love the truth do. And one of the definitions for unrighteousness, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, one of the definitions for unrighteousness is deceit, deceitful. And I believe that this is more of the sense that Paul is meaning rather than the larger social and cultural application. I could be wrong, but here's why I believe it to be the case. Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 9 through 10, love must be without hypocrisy, without deceit. Abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. Be horrified at what is evil. Cling to what is good, hold fast to it. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another. Outdo one another in showing honor. Most specifically, that first sentence, love must be free from hypocrisy or free from deceit. The meaning here is that it must not be deceitful. Notice also that Paul is addressing relational conduct within the church in this verse or in these verses the same way he is in 1 Corinthians 13. There's certainly application to be made in how we as Christians engage with the ungodly and unrighteous culture around us. But Paul's specific aim here hasn't changed from the loving relational conduct between believers in the church that honors Christ. We looked at a verse in Sunday school this morning where Paul used a military term to say, be courageous, stand firm, be strong, act like men. But right after that, he says, let everything you do be done in love. So what does he mean that love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth? If we think back to the unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17, that we looked at at the beginning, then it can only mean that to the degree that Christ's love is genuinely manifested in us, to the degree that Christ's love is genuinely, I'm having a hard time with that word, genuinely manifested in us, then we will be true. Without hypocrisy or deceit, we will be genuine. Not only before God, but also towards one another. To the degree that Christ's love abides in us, transforming us, conforming us into his image, then we will be without deceit before God in how we treat one another. We'll see and treat one another as those who have the very spirit of Jesus dwelling within us but will also recognize the same spirit dwelling in one another. And I think that if we recognized more of Jesus in one another, if we saw Jesus in one another, we might be slower to treat one another according to what love isn't and quicker to treat them according to what love is. Church, be genuine. Be without deceit with one another in your struggles and in your needs, in your failures and in your sins and in your temptations. But church, also understand that in this genuineness with one another, this this transparency, this acting 
towards one another without deceit or hypocrisy, there must be patience and kindness, discretion and discernment, wisdom and humility. There must be this quality of genuine love towards that other person who confides in you. Act with the same treatment that we would want our own struggles handled with. Is your love trustworthy enough for this? When someone is burdened with sin, ugly sin, we all have it. We all struggle with some pretty, pretty raw stuff. We struggle with emotions. We struggle with feelings. We struggle with anger. We struggle with resentment. And so for that person to come to you looking for help, looking to be unburdened, looking to be genuine before you, is the love that you will show them trustworthy enough for them to do this? This is perhaps why Paul reminds them of what love does in verse 7. Love bears all things, covers it. It doesn't parade it. It doesn't get told the ugly truth of how you really act and what you really struggle with and then place it on a banner for everyone to see, spreading like wildfire throughout the church so that it destroys and disrupts and disunifies the body. That's not what it does. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Now, this certainly doesn't mean that love enables us or requires us to passively accept or excuse or turn a blind eye to sin. That's not what it does at all. And that's certainly not what Paul is saying. Genuine love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. I think this is simply saying that it's only this quality of love that enables us to live peaceably with one another, to forgive one another when offended, knowing what we've been forgiven of and knowing that there will certainly be a time when we'll need forgiveness, probably for a worse offense, that love covers those things. This love sees beyond the offense to the Savior who abides within the offender. Yes, you have offended me, but you know what? I see Jesus in you. And I know that I know that I know that Jesus is using this particular thing to grow us both in being conformed into his image, being sanctified, being perfected, so that our love might have even a greater quality to it than what it had before. It believes and hopes in what that person will become through the same grace, patience, and kindness that has brought you to where you are. Able to endure and cover another sin, even when it's against you. This is a love that absorbs because it bears, believes, hopes, and endures for the sake of Jesus who absorbed the sins and the hatred and the offenses of his people those whom he came to save, you and me. For what? So that he could present us as spotless before the Father. So that he could present us as spotless before the Father. Do you see yourself as spotless? Man, I don't see me as spotless, not in any measure. I fail consistently. But in Christ Jesus, before God the Father, before God the Father, I am as white as snow. I have no stain whatsoever. I am presented spotless before God, a holy God who hates sin. Do you realize the power of that love. I am a sinner through and through. And 
And God's love has done such a work that God, Christ, through Christ, God does not look at me with hatred. He looks at me as one whose sin has been absorbed by his son, Jesus Christ. So now, how are you measuring up? How do we do this? How do we show this kind of love, the kind of love that absorbs the offenses of another, so as to present, so as to work hard to present that other person who has just offended you as spotless before the rest of the people in our church? How do we do that? How can we possibly have this kind of love? In and of ourselves, we can't. We cannot do it. We'll be defined by those things that Paul said love is not. Every single time. But listen to what he writes in Philippians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He writes this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and, and sympathy, if there are any of these things, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Does this sound familiar? It should. It's the same as the verses we've been looking at, only stated a little bit different. He goes on in verse five to say, have this mind among yourselves. So this quality of love, this, this love that helps us do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, we are to have this mind about us. This is an imperative. It's a command. It's not an option. We are to behave in this way. We are to have this quality of love about us. So in Paul's mind, it's not an impossibility to do. It's very much possible to do. How does he tell us that we can do this? In Christ. Only in Christ. Christ has displayed this perfectly. But if that's all he did, if all he did was display it, then we'd be hopeless to follow. But he does more than this. Christ does more than this. Remember John 17, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. That they, that you, all of us may be one even as the Father and the Son are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. The love between the Father and the Son is also ours through Jesus Christ. And so Paul continues in verse five, after giving us the command to have this mind among ourselves, he says this, this mind, this attitude, this quality of love is yours in Christ Jesus. It's not something that you don't possess. It's not something that you can't attain to. It's not something that can define the quality of your love. This isn't something, yes, that's good for Jesus. He was an extraordinary man. He was the second person of the Godhead. He can do that. I struggle. I can't do that. Yes, you can. You have the mind of Christ Jesus. We possess this love. It's not unreachable. It's not unattainable. It is ours in him. And we know this to be true because of what this love enabled Christ to do. As you continue on in verses six through eight, who though he was in the form, 
in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was humble. This was the second person of the Godhead, not clinging to all that he is as the second person in the Godhead, not grasping it as his right and his entitlement, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in a human form, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is perfect love. And it's in Jesus that we see a love displayed that is patient and kind, that isn't envious, that isn't arrogant, that isn't unbecoming or insistent upon its own way, that isn't irritable or resentful, and that completely embodies righteousness and truth. There are people all around us who are looking to be loved with this kind of genuine love. And it is only only in a church who loves Jesus Christ first and foremost above everything else that they are going to see and come to this kind of love. If an unbelieving world, an unloving world is going to see Jesus, it is going to be through Jesus working out this love through you and me. Perhaps you're struggling with how you aren't measuring up or how you haven't measured up. Perhaps you're feeling a weight of guilt in how you've acted towards people in the past. Perhaps you're thinking, man, I've really messed this up. Don't forget, do not forget the perfect, kind, patient, unresentful love that Jesus loves you with. And then look to him. Look to Christ and the mind that you have through him so that you can go and love others in the same way. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace towards us. Thank you for your kindness, your patience, your long-suffering, your forbearance. Thank you that you didn't put yourself first so that you could come willful, willingly and joyfully to save us from our sins. We thank you so much for the grace that's been given us. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in him when we act in such an unloving way. Please, Lord Jesus, conform us more and more into a, a people, a church, a bride whom you draw people to and they see your love through us. Thank you again for the mercy you've shown us. We would be lost, we would be hopeless. We would be unloving without it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Real quick announcement, so we have a luncheon. Thank you, Kevin, excellent message.
Uh, we have a luncheon downstairs as normal on the day we have the Lord's Supper. And so you'll be able to go do that.